This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit GaryNorth.com forward slash free books to download this book as a PDF. Through New Eyes Developing a Biblical View of the World James B. Jordan Copyright 1988 Published by Wolgamuth and Hyatt Brentwood, Tennessee 12. Eden The World of Transformation What was the world like when God finished making it? What was the design of raw material cosmos over which man was to take dominion? In this chapter, it will be our concern to get before us the original biblical world model. In succeeding chapters, we shall study the transformations through which God and man put the world. Before we begin, let us take an overview of the nature of biblical world modeling. The Bible provides us with a number of world models, some very simple, and some very elaborate and complex. Fairly simple world models are provided by the three decks of Noah's Ark, the three zones of Mount Sinai and Zion, and possibly the three zones of Ezekiel's stepped altar. Much more complex world models are provided by the tabernacle and temple. The Bible uses 48 verses to describe the world in Genesis 1 verse 1, through 2 verse 17. By way of contrast, the world symbolically described in Ezekiel 40 through 48 occupies 260 verses, while the world of Solomon's temple takes 346, and the world of the Mosaic tabernacle runs to a conservative 1,140 verses. We can also note that the description of New Jerusalem, also a world picture, takes 24 verses, why so many verses for the tabernacle and the temples? Because these images speak simultaneously of many things and in much rich detail. The tabernacle and temple, being God's palaces, were symbols of heaven. And since heaven is the model for the earth, they were also models for the earth. Beyond this, when we put them together with their precincts and surrounding areas, the whole constituted a heaven and earth model. As heaven as earth, and as both together, they were images of God's house. Since a human person is a temple and a tabernacle, they were also images of the individual human being in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. The human community is also a temple and a tabernacle, so that they were images of the body politic as well as a human individual. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10 through 17. Because of this, they portrayed the true man, Jesus Christ, as well as his church. John 2 verse 19. We shall expand on all this as we proceed, but it is necessary for us to take note of it here as we begin. Some matters that are relatively obscure in Genesis 2 are made clear by comparison with later world models, also bearing in mind that the later models are more glorified than the earlier ones. The four rivers that flowed out of Eden are simply a curiosity, for instance, until we associate them with the four corners of the earth, and the four corners of the altar, and the four corners of the cross. Thus, even in our initial study of the first world, we shall draw on later world models to help us understand the images presented compactly in Genesis 1 and 2. The Three-Decker Universe Bearing in mind that the Bible generally uses the language of appearance in describing the world, we can see the proper sense in which the Bible presents a triple-decker universe. The second commandment prohibits bowing before any image made in the likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Exodus 20 verse 4 This three-part cosmos is fundamental to biblical imagery and symbolism. In Genesis 1 verse 9 we read that the waters were gathered into one place. This seems to be a reference to the oceans of the world, which in fact are continuous with one another, so that all the continents are in reality large islands in this one vast ocean. Except for a few isolated lakes, all the bodies of water on the earth are one large sea, and so the one gathering can also be called seas, plural. The sea level establishes the limit of the land, thus the sea is always below the land, and since the sea goes down and down, it clearly stretches into an abyss. Moreover, the land is clearly, in a visual sense, founded on the seas, established on the flood. Psalm 24, verse 2. Suppose all the land of the earth were connected so that the bodies of water were separated. In that case, a mirror image of the real world 
we would say that the seas were borne up by the land. The reverse is the case, however. Each island of land, however large, is bounded by the sea. Thus, in imagery, we have a three-decker universe. Sea at the bottom, then land, and finally heaven. The three-decker world was referred to in Exodus 20, verse 11, Psalm 146, verse 6, Nehemiah 9, verse 6, and Revelation 10, verse 6. This visual three-decker world becomes a symbol for a three-decker moral world, hell, earth, heaven. We have come to the wider symbolic structures established by the wording of Genesis 1. We see that there are two heavens in Genesis 1, the highest heaven, created on day 1, and the earthly sky heaven, the firmament, established on day 2. The sky heaven is an image, a symbol, a reminder of the highest heaven. By implication, the same thing is true of the sea, or abyss. The deep, the abyss of the sea, points beyond itself to the abyss, the place where the devil and the wicked will spend eternity. This ultimate abyss did not yet exist in Genesis 1, however, because neither angels nor men had yet sinned, and that is why it is not mentioned in Genesis 1. Once the ultimate abyss was established, however, the ocean abyss became an image, a symbol, a reminder of it, just as the sky heaven is an image and reminder of the ultimate heaven. After the fall of man, the separation of land and sea becomes a common symbol for the separation of God's people and the ungodly nations of the world. The wicked are like the rest of the sea, while the righteous are given God's holy land to dwell in. As the chaotic sea tries constantly to eat the land, so the Gentiles try to invade God's land. In the Old Testament, the nations are frequently pictured in terms of the sea. To protect his people, God at various times defeated the oceanic nations and bounded them. It often is the gathering of the sea into one place that makes the land visible. When the wicked gather together against God and his people, he vindicates his people and defeats their enemies. Psalm 2 And notice the language of Revelation 20, verse 8-9. through 9. Satan will deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog, Prince, and Magog, people, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the sea, and they came up on the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. God said in the beginning that it was good for sea and land to be separated, Genesis 1 verse 10, and at the end he will remove the ungodly human sea from the land and put them into the ultimate abyss, Revelation 20 verse 15. Christians should not be worried when accused of holding to a three-decker world model. There is nothing pagan or primitive about such a world view. As a matter of simple, observable fact, the sea lies below the land and the sky is above the land. This simple observation is relatively meaningless, of course, until we see that the sky is an image of heaven and reminds us of our calling to grow into the fullness of God's likeness and bring this world toward glory. Similarly, the sea has to do with life and potential. The Bible consistently speaks of water as life-giving. And it is water that feeds plants, animals, and men in the land, enabling them to grow toward their heavenly calling. Thus, water undergirds the land, simulating it toward perfection. Additionally, because of sin, the sea reminds us of the abyss, the opposite of heaven, where impenitent sinners will reside forever. The Four Corners of the Earth One of the most familiar symbols of scripture is that of the four corners of the earth. Isaiah 11 verse 12 says that God will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And Ezekiel 7 verse 2 says that the end is coming on the four corners of the earth. In Revelation 20 verse 8, the wicked are gathered from the four corners of the earth. To understand this imagery, it is helpful to recall that the Bible pictures the world as a house. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Job 38 verse 4 through 6. The world is like a house, the firmament like its ceiling, and the mountains like the sky's pillars, so that the collapse of the mountains is associated with the rending of the firmament ceiling. Isaiah 34 verse 3 through 4. Revelation 6 verse 13 through 14. As we have mentioned, the tabernacle and temple were world models, and the world being conceived as a cosmic house. A complementary image used in scripture for the world is that of the altar. Altars must be made of the earth, 
Exodus 20, verse 24 through 25, and have four corners. And these figures, the four corners of the earth, Revelation 7, verse 1, and 9, verse 13. Thus, the fire on the bronze altar figured the judgment that must come upon the world, and the sacrifice spoke of the fact that the fire must come either upon a substitute or upon humanity itself. In the same way, the incense burning on the altar of incense spoke of the universal duty and privilege of men to stand upon the world and pray to God. Thus, when the Bible speaks of the four corners of the world, it reminds us of the world as house and altar. The house imagery sees the world as a container for men, while the altar imagery sees the world as a platform for men. Both images are used throughout scripture. In terms of the world as house, judgment means the collapse of the house, the shaking of its mountain pillars, the falling of its ceiling stars, etc. In terms of the world as altar, judgment means fire falling upon the altar. Positively, the world is a house to be adorned and in which man worships, and also an altar on which man grows and upon which he offers himself and his faithful good works to God. Not only is the biblical cosmic world four-cornered in a symbolic sense, so is the biblical social world. Israelite society, under the judges and kings, had four corners or cornerstones at its top. These men were the supreme judge or king and his three top advisors. This word occurs in Judges 20 verse 2 and 1 Samuel 14 verse 38, where it is translated chiefs. Thus David had three mighty men, he being the chief corner, 2 Samuel 23, 1 Chronicles 11. Similarly, Jesus had Peter, James, and John, who were the three corner pillars of the apostolic church, Galatians 2 verse 9, remembering that Jesus was himself the fourth and chief cornerstone of the new temple, Ephesians 2 verse 20, 1 Peter 2 verse 6. This image of the four cornered world takes its rise from the fact that four rivers flowed out of the Garden of Eden to water the whole world. They doubtless did not actually flow in four opposite directions. Indeed, they all seem to have flowed south, as we shall see. Symbolically, however, they carried the Edenic pattern to the four corners of the earth. The task of Adam's descendants would be to follow the four rivers and carry with them the kingdom pattern, extending it over the whole earth and bringing the world from primordial to eschatological glory. The four rivers going to the four corners can and should be associated with the four faces of the cherubim, Ezekiel 1, verse 10, the four sides of the camp of Israel, Numbers 2, and the four limbs of the cross. It is a fundamental symbol of the world's structure, north and south. Ancient man knew that the world was a sphere, and the Bible affirms in Job 26, verse 7, that, that God hung the earth on nothing. It is a fundamental mistake to assume that ancient or medieval world diagrams with four corners or riding on the backs of elephants or bulls, were taken by educated people as literal pictures of the world. They were always understood to be symbolic. For instance, the biblical world picture says that the earth is founded upon the seas, Psalm 24, verse 2, because the sea is below the earth as we have seen. All the same, we are given information in Genesis 2 that helps us ascertain roughly the geographical location of the land and garden of Eden. Eden was a real place, though it was washed away in the flood. We are told that the four rivers flowed out of the garden and that they flowed south. The first river, Pishon, went to the land of Havilah, Arabia. The second, Gihon, to Cush, Ethiopia. And the third and fourth were the Tigris and Euphrates. These names were probably put in by Moses when he put Genesis in its final shape, but they still tell us the locations to which these rivers initially flowed. The only way one river can break up into four streams and go to these four places as if it rises either in the north or the south. It seems most likely that the Pishon flowed down what is now the Jordan River Valley toward Arabia, and the Gihon flowed down what is now the Nile, though in the opposite direction toward Ethiopia. Remember, the flood drastically changed the world. This hypothesis is lent credibility by the references to God's kingdom in the far north, Psalm 48 verse 2 says that Mount Zion is in the far north, but in fact, Zion was located in southern Israel. The language must be symbolic, but of what? The throne of God is stated to be in the north in Isaiah 14 verse 13, and God is said to come from the north in Job 37 verse 22, and Ezekiel 1 verse 4. 
It is easy to trace the line back from the locations of these rivers to a hypothetical point of origin to the north, and that point turns out to be in Armenia. After the flood, the ark rested in Armenia, and this is the point from which the new creation spread out, Genesis 8 verse 4. Since rivers flow downhill, Eden was clearly located on a height. This is consistent with the high mountains of the Armenian region, though of course the flood may have changed the topography. What emerges from this discussion, in addition to a possible location for the original Eden, is another symbolic picture. To the north is God's throne, in the center is where men live, and to the south is the outlying world. This symbolic structure is picked up particularly in Zechariah 6. The north, God's throne, was corrupted by Satan. When Adam turned the garden over to him, the armies of God in Zechariah 6 take judgment and then cleansing blessing to the north, re-establishing it first. Judgment also proceeds to the south, but without cleansing at this point in history, the three environments. The Bible tells us that God planted the garden in Eden, on the east side of that land, Genesis 2 verse 8. This establishes three environments on the earth, garden, Eden, world. Men would proceed from the garden and home in the north downstream toward the lands of the south. They would be motivated to do so by the fact that there were good minerals in the southern lands, as we are told that in Havilah, Arabia, there were gold, delium, and onyx. Similarly, in another symbolic picture, men would follow the four rivers out to the four corners of the earth. Let us consider the three environments. The land of Eden would be Adam's initial home. It would be the place where he slept, where his children were reared, and so forth. Home is where man returns when his work is done. The outlying lands, Havilah, Cush, and so forth, would be the place of man's labor. They figure the place where Adam did his work, wrestling joyfully with the world to make it more and more glorious. His sons would move downstream and set up new homes in these lands. Perhaps Cain would dwell with his family in Havilah and Abel in Cush. There would be trade between the members of humanity, as each land's peculiar treasure were swapped for those of other regions. And then there was the garden. This was the sanctuary, the place where Adam would meet with God at the times of his appointment. Adam was created on the sixth day, and the next day was God's Sabbath. Adam was to meet with God, but by the time God arrived, Adam was already in sin and had to be cast out. Nonetheless, this pattern was established. Had Adam not sinned, his sons would have set up garden sanctuaries in Havilah, Cush, and other lands. These three environments correspond to the three-decker world of Genesis 1, but on a lateral plane. The garden sanctuary is a contact point with heaven. The homeland is to be related to the earth, and thus God's people, Israel, were given land. The outlying lands reached by rivers are to be associated with the sea, and thus the Gentile nations are pictured as the sea. Each of these environments was to be patterned after heaven. Heaven is not only the pattern for the sanctuary and worship, it is also the pattern for home and homeland, and also for work in the world. Ultimately, the New Jerusalem is city and sanctuary and world all in one. This shows the eschatological coalescence of culture and cult. As long as we live in history, however, we can apply the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes 3 to ourselves. For everything there is a proper time, a time to laugh and a time to weep, a time to worship in the sanctuary, a time to work in the world, and a time to relax at home. Thus, the three environments will continue to be distinct throughout history, and each has to be heavenized in a way peculiar to its nature. Because of his sin, Adam was excluded from the garden sanctuary. It would not be until the Mosaic Covenant that men would be readmitted to the garden, and then there was restrictions on who might enter. Sin did not stop with Adam, however, and Cain, for his sin, was excluded from the Edenic homeland as well. Genesis 4 verse 16 at the flood, because of the maturation of humanity's sin, mankind was excluded from the whole world, and a new world was begun. When God made the world, he made the sea first. Then he drew out the land, and finally he planted the garden sanctuary. Just so, after the flood, we read first of the table of nations, Genesis 10. Then we find the call of Abraham and the promise of the land, Genesis 12. 
With the Mosaic Tabernacle, we have the erection of a provisional garden sanctuary. Only when the land is finally secured under David do we find the full establishment of a permanent garden sanctuary under Solomon, the temple. Israel sinned, however, and Nebuchadnezzar came to destroy the temple and Jerusalem, 2 Kings 25, verse 1-21. through 21. When the people continued in their rebellion, they were all deported from the land into exile, 2 Kings 25, verse 22 through 26. Then God rebuilt the world, first converting the pagan nations and restoring them under Daniel, Daniel 4 and 6, then returning the people to the land, and finally rebuilding the garden temple under Haggai and Zechariah, Joshua, Zerubbabel, Haggai 1 through 2, Ezra 1 through 5. Of course, regardless of where they lived symbolically, men always had access to God in heaven. Thus Noah worshipped God under the open sky, as did converted Gentiles of all ages. Abraham worshipped God in the land, as did all devout Jews. After Moses, the Israelites worshipped God in the courtyard of the sanctuary, the garden. Only the Aaronic priests, however, were permitted to worship God in the tabernacle and temple, all of this shows that the fullness of access to God was restricted until the coming of the Messiah. In the New Covenant, men have immediate and full access to God in heaven. There are no longer any symbolic restrictions, Hebrews 7 through 10. Nonetheless, in the way of cultural movement, we find that when Christians first penetrate a pagan culture, they have to meet in homes and even catacombs. When the culture has been permeated by Christian influence, and becomes a Christian homeland, then the great and beautiful garden churches, cathedrals, can be built. So it was with Rome, so it was with Europe, so it must be in our day. Our cathedrals have been defiled, and our homes are under assault as officials of the secular humanist government seek to close down Christian schools and invade Christian homes. Thus, ours is not a day of cathedral building, but a day of cultural permeation. Faithfulness must come first and only then will glory come. High Ground Rivers flow downhill, which means that the garden out of which they flowed was on high ground. Not the highest, however, because the river arose in the homeland of Eden, which means that the garden was lower than other parts of Eden. This is, perhaps, not what we should expect, but it is reiterated in Psalm 125, verse 2. As the mountains surrounded Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people which draws on the fact that the mountains surrounding Zion were actually taller than she. Indeed, Mount Moriah, where the temple was built, was lower than Zion proper, where the city of Jerusalem was built. In fact, as the waters in the Garden of Eden flowed from the land of Eden, so the water used on Moriah flowed from springs on Zion. Yet we are told that some day the mountain of the Lord's house will be established as the chief of the mountains, and will be raised above the hills. Isaiah 2, verse 2. What does this mean? First, the true mountain of God is in heaven, not on earth, and thus not approachable by man. It is always high, as the heavens are high above the earth. Second, man's earthly sanctuary, while it starts high, is to grow and develop in glory during history. During the infancy of humanity, the sanctuary is protected with the swaddling clothes of the mountains round about. Compare Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Once maturity has been attained, then the holy mountain stands forth as the greatest of the mountains. A third aspect of this prophecy is seen in that Jesus left Zion and Moriah behind, transferred his kingdom to the mountain of Olives, which was the highest mountain in the area. Spiritually, though, the mountain of his kingdom is a ladder to heaven, whose top breaks through the firmament to the throne of God. Revelations 21, verse 10. 22 verse 1. Mountain symbolism is found in all world religions. The Hindus had Mount Meru, the Japanese Fujiyama, and the Greeks Olympus. It is also found throughout scripture. Thus, Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah, Genesis 22 verse 2. Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 through 24. Elijah defeated Baal on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18 and received his commission renewed on Mount Sinai, 1 Kings 19. Jesus preached his definitive sermon on a mount, 
Matthew 5, was transfigured on a mount, 2 Peter 1, verse 16 through 18, and gave his final great commission on a mountain, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Beyond this, we find that Christians are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, a reference to Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and also a symbol of the righteous person, Matthew 5, verse 14. Believers are God's people, mountain. And someday the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Isaiah 2, verse 2. God's holy mountain grows until it fills the whole world. Daniel 2, verse 34 through 35. This can be so because the mountain symbolizes not only the individual human person, but also the church. We have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels in festal array, and to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Hebrews 12, verse 22 through 23. The idea of a holy mountain is a place where men can meet God, because the top of a mountain is nearest to heaven. This is why Israel sacrificed on high places. The image, symbolically, is that of a pyramid, for a pyramid is but a stylized mountain. The four sides, or the four edges of the pyramid, correspond to the four rivers that flow out, taking God's kingdom influences to all the earth. Man's position at the top of the mountain enables him to see the heavenly pattern, and then brings it down to the earth below as did Moses. Thus, mountains and pyramids are ladders to heaven. At the Tower of Babel, sinful men tried to build such a pyramid ladder from the ground up, but God forbade it. The ground had been defiled by Adam's sin. Since Adam was made of earth and his sin corrupted the earth, thus, if there were to be a new ladder to heaven, it would have to proceed from above to below. Jacob saw such a ladder in a prophetic vision, Genesis 28, verse 12. In fulfillment, the new Jerusalem came from heaven to earth, not vice versa, on the day of Pentecost. The new Jerusalem is a gem-studded pyramid overlaid on a mountain, Revelation 21, verse 2. Unlike the holy mountains of the Old Covenant, the New Jerusalem is definitely, symbolically, on the highest of all mountains, because the apex of the pyramid reaches into heaven itself and the throne of God, Revelation 22, verse 1. And it is from here that the restored rivers flow to bring life to the world. Whence came these gems and gold for Jerusalem? From the outlying lands. Neither Eden nor Israel, it seems, were rich in precious stones. The Jews got the raw materials for the tabernacle and gems for the high priest ephod from Egyptian spoil, Exodus 35, and from their travels in Havilah, Arabia. Solomon's temple was adorned with gold and gems from other lands, 2 Samuel 8, verse 11, 1 Kings 7, verse 51, 9, verse 28, 10, verse 11. The message is that God's house cannot be fully built until all nations are converted and cooperate in its spiritual development. As the rivers of spiritual blessing go out from Jerusalem, the church, so the nations return their tithes for her adornment. It remains to note that altars were also holy mountains, ladders to heaven. We have just mentioned the contrast between Jacob's ladder and the Tower of Babel. More broadly speaking, there is a contrast between the Tower of Babel and the altars of worship set up by Abraham. Abraham's altars were probably just pillars made up of stone and earth, but what they symbolize is set out for us in an important vision in Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel describes an altar in the form of a step pyramid. The top section is called the mountain of God, and the platform on top for the fire is called the hearth. A literal translation of Ezekiel 43 verse 15 is, And the mountain of God, four cubits high, and from the hearth, four horns extend upwards. While the altar in the tabernacle did not have this shape, the statement in Ezekiel clearly expresses the theology of the altar. When God appeared on Mount Sinai, the top was covered with fire and smoke. Exodus 19, verse 18. We can hardly fail to see the visual association of this with the burning sacrifices on the bronze altar and the incense on the golden altar. Moreover, altars for sacrifice were generally built on the tops of mountains before the tabernacle was set up. 
Genesis 22, verse 9. And during the interregnum between the dissolution of the tabernacle and the building of the temple, 1 Samuel 9, verse 12. Thus, the association of altar with holy mountain is fairly pervasive. Conclusion First, with all this information before us, we can construct a symbolic picture of the original world. Above the earth was the firmament heaven, a picture of the highest heaven. Below the earth was the sea, a picture of the abyss. Rising out of the center of the earth was a holy mountain from which flowed four rivers to carry spiritual influences to the four corners of the earth. Stationed at the top of the pyramid was man, God's agent for world transformation. From this vantage point, man could look up and see the heavenly blueprint and then come down the mountain to work with the earth, making it like heaven. Second, we are now to the point of summarizing the concept of a ladder to heaven. Any ladder to heaven is of necessity a model of heaven and earth, with heaven at the top and the earthly sanctuary, the gate of heaven, lower down or at the bottom. We can also say that any heaven and earth model is also a ladder to heaven. For instance, the tabernacle of Moses. The Israelite citizen was admitted to the forecourt or the gateway of the tabernacle courtyard where he offered sacrifice. He was not allowed to ascend the holy mountain or the bronze altar, and thus he was not to go farther back into the courtyard than the altar. The altar, as holy mountain, ascended up from the firmament. The labor of cleansing thus signified the heavenly sea of Genesis 1 verse 7, and not the cosmic or Gentile sea of the waters below. The holy place had to do with the visible or firmament heaven, God's outer core, while the most holy had to do with the highest heaven, the very throne of God. The Bible speaks of both the highest heaven and the firmament heaven as tents or tabernacles of God. We shall of course look at the tabernacle in more detail in chapter 15. For now we only wish to see it and the temple as models of heaven and earth, and thus as ladders to heaven. Ladders to heaven and models of heaven and earth speak of two related things. It is relatively easy for us to see that they speak of environments. Heaven is an environment, and so is the earth. The tabernacle and temple, with their courtyards, were environments, physical environments. A special tree, an altar, a monument pillar, a holy mountain. These are physical environments. Each of these, however, pictures a social or human environment. We have seen that the heavenly host has to do very often with rulers or with saints. In terms of the political arrangement of a nation, the heavens are the rulers and the earth is the ruled. Isaiah 13, verse 13, 34, verse 4. In terms of the spiritual polity of the world, God's people are positioned in the heavens. Philippians 3, verse 20. Ephesians 1 verse 22 verse 6, Hebrews 12 verse 22 through 23. We have seen that trees speak of people, and that an environment of trees, such as the temple and tabernacle, speaks of a body politic. We have seen that the temple and tabernacle were symbols both of the righteous individual and thus of Jesus Christ, the true ladder to heaven, and also of the church as a body politic. The same thing is true of mountains, which symbolize nations and people. God's people are his mountain, a mountain that grows and fills the earth. Daniel 2, verse 35. This imagery is absolutely fundamental to biblical revelation. We have to consider each passage in context to see what it is saying, of course, but we need to be alert to symbolism and imagery. The Bible uses these images to express its worldview, according to each stage of history. To an examination of these stages of history, we must now turn our attention, beginning with the world of Noah. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator 
or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.